and, so uh, back and the fact that you brought that to the federal government, like right no president's right done, is, uh, I think, pretty significant. Right, right, even right against the chair. Right. There you go. Well, who's Hi, Larry? Hi, how are you? Hi, how are you? How are you? Hi, how are you? Right. Well, gentlemen, sit down and get wired up for sound. Our usual safety measure here. Mm -hmm. We're all for it. Very helpful. Good example of big government. <laughs> no, personalized government. <laughs> personalized Seeing service. the individual's problems. <laughs> I see. Well, as you recall, we had a conversation just last week, and this will be somewhat in the nature of following up and elaborating on some of those points. On the domestic side, as you look ahead, is tax reform the biggest specific domestic goal? Oh, no. I think it's a very important one, and I think it's been a long time coming. If there is a way, I know how complicated and difficult it is. I haven't seen uh, what uh, they've uh, any evidence of what they're going to come up with. They've been studying it for a long, hard time, and which indicates how difficult it is. But we do have a tax system that, first of all, when you have a system that can uh, have at least a hundred billion dollars estimated that is not being collected from people who legitimately owe it, there is a flaw. And there certainly is a flaw when you have a tax system that has become so complicated that even the government has to warn people, the kind of people who uh, normally go down to the tax office with their papers and fill out their tax form there. And the government has had to warn the people that not even the government employees understand the regulations enough that they, that in other words, the people will still be at blame, mm -hmm. to blame, yeah. uh, even if that's the way they've made out their tax. Well, I think it's time that we applied ourselves to doing something about that. But no, the, it's a part also of the whole economic uh, problem that faces us and the thing that we've been working on, and I think we've made a good start uh, with our, our economic program. And this is a case now of uh, going further with it. Uh, if, for example, in the, uh, just to throw one figure out at you, our, our estimate of what we have saved, business and the people, the consumers, uh, just in the reducing of needless regulations, we estimate over a 10-year period about $150 billion savings to the people, not the reduction in government costs. And things of that kind <coughs> reveal what a fertile field is out there. Will you insist that whatever tax program you finally settle on and propose, whatever tax reform, uh, be presented, when you present it, that it be revenue neutral? It has to be. Yes, I've, uh, in, as a matter of fact, if anything, uh, I would hope that if we really could broaden the base that we could even make it uh, a little on the taxpayer's side, that it would be uh, uh, more than neutral, that they would actually individually get a break. Uh, one thing, above all, I won't stand still for anything that, under the guise of reform, uh, is just another way of saying a tax increase. So this is designed not to have any impact on lowering the deficit, the tax reform package? Well, only in the sense of that $100 billion <laughs> out here we're not getting now, that that, that might help. But um, the, the real impact on the deficit must come from continued growth. And there again, taxes figure. I believe that the tax, our tax cut was a major factor in the recovery and the expansion that we're having. And the, I tried with my fingers once before some of you to uh, explain what it is. If we can, at the same time we bring down the rate of increase in government growth, in spending, uh, at the same time that with the growth in the economy, the overall revenues for government increase because of that economic growth, not because of any rate increase for the... There's got to be a point up here where those lines come together. 
And when they do, you have a balanced budget. Do you think it's possible to close the, the deficit gap without cutting back on entitlement programs? You've, you've ruled Social Security out, but say Medicare and some of the others. Well, let's, let's look at Social Security, for example. I know there are a number of things that are called entitlement programs. All of them must be looked at. But in the case of Social Security, I claim that Social Security cannot be linked to the deficit in any way. This program is based on and totally funded by a payroll tax dedicated to that purpose alone. So if you reduced in some way Social <coughs> Security, that money would simply go back in the trust fund or you would wind up having to reduce, uh, if you could, the Social Security payroll tax. But in no way is that I know that Social Security is counted into the entire budget, but since you have an earmarked special tax that is totally supporting that, then it isn't responsible for the deficit. You said uh, the other day that uh, on foreign policy now that you wouldn't buy the Russians back to the bargaining table, indicating you would not make any particular concessions. But what do you do? Just wait them out, confident that they'll no, no, see the light themselves? No, we're going to keep that. I just met, and I want to make sure that this is understood, that in buying them back, to be in the position that they would be able to say that they forced concessions from us simply by refusing to negotiate. That would be the worst thing that you could do if you're going to have ongoing negotiations. But what we want them to understand is that if they will present to us whatever it is that uh, they were unwilling to discuss in ours or whatever it is that they wanted to add uh, as an item for discussion, fine, we've told them over and over again. We're flexible. We went at them in the intermediate, here's an example, we went at them in the intermediate range missiles and since we are uh, supplying the Allies with a deterrent, at their request, and the request was approved by the previous administration, so we're carrying out what had already been approved, and the Soviets already had in place uh, more than a thousand nuclear warheads targeted on our NATO allies in that theater there. And yet they don't want us to come in and provide the allies with a deterrent. And we said, then why don't we agree to a nuclear free zone. Why don't we come to the point of neither side having any at all of those intermediate range weapons? And the Soviets wouldn't negotiate that, but they did indicate that maybe they, you know, they might listen to reductions. And we said, all right, fine. We'll, we'll tell you now that we still, our ultimate goal would be that ho to hope that we could arrive at a nuclear free zone, zero, zero. But in the interim, we'll <coughs> be very happy to sit down and discuss with you a reduction of the number of weapons of that type. And they still walked away on the grounds that they'd bought half our proposal. They'd bought one zero. We were to be zero. And uh, they would continue to have a monopoly uh, on the weapons there. And uh, there was no way that we could hold still for that. Do you think there's a need for a kind of super arms control coordinator in the White House who would report directly to, to you and uh, Bud McFarlane and uh, Secretary Schultz? I, uh, I was surprised to see this subject brought up, something of that kind. We, uh, uh, we never really sat down and uh, said uh, or asked ourselves, is such a thing needed? Would it be advantageous? Would it add anything or not? Uh, uh, we've, we've talked many ways of how to approach the Russians or what is the best way. We've, we've volunteered proposals to them and, uh, and I did to Gromyko about how can we maintain a continued uh, conversation here. What, what would be pleasing to them? Have, uh, like we did in the near Middle East, have some special emissary or not? So there's been no agreement of anything uh, of any kind on that, but so I couldn't rule it out or rule it in. If if uh, we sit down and talk about it, and uh, and that sounds uh, to them as if that's something they might want to get along with, fine. 
prairie fire, that marvelous phrase back yes. from 1967. You used it again in Sacramento this week. And I guess that's another way of talking about political realignment or a political sea change. Do you have the feeling that what's happening out there with your reelection by what we gather is going to be a pretty large margin uh, is such a sea change? Is it, is it bigger than Ronald Reagan? Is it, how, how do you describe what's happening well, there? Well, remember what the prairie fire term was used in connection with. It was, it was the whole philosophy of government that is at issue right now. As I said, we've, California <laughs> uh, was a perfect uh, imitator of what was happening at the federal level. The runaway government spending, the runaway government authority, the more and more intrusiveness on the part of, uh, I said once that, uh, that if uh, Washington caught cold, California sneezed. Um, so what I was talking about then was the reforms that we started here in California to get more authority back at, in local government here, to reduce government spending and the, the rapid growth of it, all the things that we're talking about uh, uh, with regard now to the national scene. And that was what I said when I said the prairie fire, that if we can succeed, if we can do these things, we can start a prairie fire. Well, uh, I think in a way uh, maybe there has been some prairie fire that uh, reached the shores of the Potomac. Uh, one, for example, our, our reform of welfare. Nothing had ever been done in the country, uh, such as we, we did here. And um, I just, I think that the, the fact that we have the federal government for four years now that has not been talking about spending programs, which was always the subject of discussion before for the last 50 years. But the discussions and the debates have been over cuts. How much do we reduce? What do we eliminate? But now you're going to have that burning for another four years at least, you well, anticipate, we anticipate. I'm I think we can take a poll in this room and we'd all anticipate. I'll it. throw a little kindling on the fire. <laughs> uh, but I mean, has it become bigger than your own personal victory. I hope so. I think, I think what we're seeing out there is, uh, I've never taken it personally, I think what we're seeing is that a lot of people who uh, more and more felt the hand of government on, uh, on their shoulder uh, and a restraining hand uh, not urging them forward. Uh, more and more awareness that uh, the government was getting unmanageable and beyond their control and certainly unmanageable as to cost, you stop to think that the federal government in 1974, the Congress adopted this plan supposedly to get control of the budget. And uh, we, I don't think we've had a budget since. Uh, the, so I think this is what's, what's happened. The people have seen an opening and they've said, yes, let's Let's carry it through. Do you think this is a, a beginning, or more evidence of a long-lasting political realignment? This, what looks to be a large victory today on top of your victory in 1980? Well, uh, for the, again, for the philosophy, yes. I don't think the people, having seen uh, that some changes could be made, I don't think they're suddenly going to uh, uh, turn around and walk away and let uh, the big government advocates creep back in and uh, put everything back in place. Of course, whether they do or not depends to a large extent where the party, where your party goes in the coming years. Now, there's been some speculation which got into print. I don't think you've ever been asked about it directly to the effect that you would consider midway through a second term stepping down uh, and letting George Bush carry it forward. I don't know where that came from either, and it was a, a surprise to me. No, I, I haven't considered anything of the kind. And wouldn't. And wouldn't. But what do you think of, uh, of the idea of the incumbent helping to choose his own heir? Are you for that in principle or against it as you enter your last term? I've um, 
you look back, you'll find that I have avoided that very much. Uh, and I think it's, that's a decision for the people to make. You wouldn't endorse George Bush for the nomination before uh, the nomination? Then. I'm not even going to let me, myself think about that. I have the greatest admiration from him. He has been, I think, uh, thinking of a vice president as a partner to the presidency. Uh, I, I can't recall any uh, in the history that I know about that is equal to his participation uh, in government. But now, uh, if as the years go by and the time comes around, uh, uh, there are choices to be made. That's uh, something I haven't thought about or faced. You rarely talk about what you feel about being president. Could you tell us what, what are the one or two things that you have found most satisfying and fulfilling as president? What are the one or two things that you have found most frustrating disappointing? Well, I think the frustrating and the disappointing thing is uh, trying to get the ponderous wheels of the legislative process in motion on things that you feel desperately need to be done. The other, the other one, maybe it comes down to smaller things than great um, legislative battles or anything the ability sometimes to have brought to your attention, uh, even if it's an individual case or something, uh, and to be able to do something about it. You mean an individual case of personal hardship? Is that what you mean? Uh, yes, and uh, mm -hmm. to, say, rectify uh, some injustice that's being done. Uh, those, are, uh, those are wonderful and rewarding moments. And uh, surely getting the 25% tax cut must have been pretty. Oh, yes. Day. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. There are many times, I, I can't deny, there are things like that. You go back upstairs feeling 10 feet tall when you've actually made something uh, come true. Well, right now, for example, uh, take a look at with all of the so called deficit and everything. Uh, we came in with government increasing its rate of spending over 17 percent a year and it's down around six percent a year now well when i think back over the last half century of this just skyrocketing of government costs and then uh, to see that that line that was going up that way has at least been brought down here well it makes you feel uh, you can bring it down a little lower mr president thank you very much How's Mrs. Right. Reagan? Is she, hmm? How's Mrs. Reagan? Is she feeling better? Uh, well, it's a funny thing. I'm kind of concerned. She seems to, she's a, a, feels a little unsteady. Yet she really hurt herself. <laughs> it was a, in the middle of the night there, and I. I wish her our best. Well, you you know how the fall took place. It, Not exactly. Oh, well the, the, luxury of the hotel and all and the one of those were very attractive looking the bed is up on a on a platform oh. and uh, you know in the middle of the night she got cold and there was an extra uh, cover in the room and she got up and forgot all about that platform and the next step <laughs> went out and there was nothing oh. there and she she did a header into a chair mm. and she's she's got quite an egg concealed under her hairdo well, as I say, wish her our best. I will. I wouldn't be Thank you very much, sir. All right. right. Being pretty tired from the and campaign. Congratulations. Yeah. It looks like a, yes. You must uh, feel 10 feet tall today. Oh, uh, I do. Thanks for joining us. And who is that now? Who is that in Montana? Uh, a guy named Cousins is running against, against Baucus. Against Baucus? Is he leading him? Leading He's him. running against who? Well, uh, listen, that's Baucus. the sleeper that I think... Uh, somebody told yeah. me that we might have a shot at that. Well, you know, that he was he was a guy that we thought we might be able yeah. to. But then, but then, then he the calmed No, the senator to campaign committee said we, we were unable to recruit a good yeah. candidate. So they wrote, so yeah. wrote the rate. Of course, race. let me see. Mon that one is only two hours difference. This one's only one yeah, hour difference. So this is Is that 50? Yeah. That's excellent. I mean, I, I wouldn't bank put anything on the last yeah. Yeah. yeah, I really wouldn't. Oh, boy. But, uh, but these hmm. races here, West Virginia evidently is very good. Kentucky. 
which we didn't, you know, we didn't go If in. we could win that one, wow. Okay, okay we're ready? The, uh, the Kentucky, the defense. All right.